Episode 8, Vigilante Justice, begins with the story of a man shot twice and then tied to the rear bumper of a pickup truck to be dragged to his eventual death. Our good friend Dale, the cop, sits down with us to talk about the breakdown in the rule of law, the dramatic rise in violent crime, and where we're headed. Welcome to the David Ross Show. We are getting back into podcasting and soon video casting. And uh, to that end, um, almost exactly a year later, um, Dale, I've got you back here. And the last time we talked, uh, it was uh, kind of in the middle of nationwide uprisings about uh, uh, the death of George Floyd, um, how police... We're handling uh, those uprisings, both uh, personally as well as uh, professionally, and um, what might make things better. We've had a year of um, more coronavirus than I care to talk about <laughs> uh, that that uh, I think as much as anything else has contributed to uh, depersonalizing and objectifying other people. Um, it, it's easy to lob uh, insults, or in some cases, uh, lob Molotov cocktails when you don't see another person as a human being. And, and uh, there's allegations that police uh, have, in some cases, been guilty of that as well. Uh, we're now around each other again. People are starting to come out of the woodwork. A um, whole lot of things happened in the last year. But what happened in the last week was, to me, kind of a, um, a canary in a coal mine of where we are with our state of the, the rule of law. Um, Michael Campbell, a man uh, not far from here in Lakewood, Washington, uh, he woke up, he was apparently sleeping in his truck in a parking lot, woke up to some grinding noise and opened his truck door and saw a leg sticking out from under his pickup and somebody was grinding, cutting his catalytic converter off, something that you hear way too much. Almost every day I hear somebody somewhere, social media, next door, a friend of a friend, uh, newspapers, TV news, whatever, catalytic converters are, are just like uh, gold, um, well, because it's platinum inside of them. <laughs> but uh, he apparently just got out and shot the guy right there, grabbed his handgun, shot the guy, um, shot him again, uh, tied the guy who was alive after, after being shot twice to the back of his bumper and drug him for a significant distance, apparently, to a field, and then left him, left him there, and, and uh, the man eventually died, and uh, he was caught driving back by the field as a witness was was talking with police reporting the, the initial crime. So heinous, um, graphic, uh, of course, um, sensational, and, and it's been all over the news. Uh, to me, I, I wrote a little bit about it, that it's scary because it is uh, gruesome, but it's more scary because it is indicative, I think, of people seeing too much for too long of a breakdown in the rule of law, people violating all kinds of laws. We have skyrocketing murder rates and violent crime rates in over a, a dozen cities was the last thing that I read. And there were some that have, you know, they've gone up eightfold uh, violent crime rates have gone up in, in cities, I think, like Minneapolis and, and somewhere near that in New York and Chicago. Um, what do you say about all that? So my brain went like three or four different places while you were talking about all of that. So I, <laughs> I, I tend to do run on sentences. <clears throat> no, I, I had a question for you, actually, uh, on the heel of that myself. But um so which piece of it, you know, just in general? Do you, do you think that we are seeing um, any unintended consequences of the breakdown of order over the last year? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Okay. <laughs> I know. Elaborate. So, yeah. Go ahead. Well, is that something that you could have seen and predicted a year ago when we last talked? Like, hey, if we keep saying it's okay to go, um, you know, in, in a riot, go grab cops and, and throw them on the ground to free your buddy, a little Antifa kid. 
Um, or if you think it's okay to um, not get out of the car when the cop tells you to get out of the car. Um, or take his taser from him and then start shooting the taser at him as you're running away and then expect not to be shot. Sure. Or or, <laughs> or pass uh, laws that say we simply cannot, uh, you know, uh, pursue. The first time I heard of a, of a police department um, banning high-speed pursuits, you know, I thought, mm, no, nah, they don't have a good thinker in that legislature, that chief executive, that that agency, whatever, the... the the person who thinks they're more aware and woke by not not catching people doing bad things because it's going to save traffic accidents and so on. But that's is been this, happening for a long time. Right. But we now, what we saw here in Washington where I am is um, departments are now putting out, uh, in fact, the department that you used to be at it put out a, a series of columns about this is the way the law is changing because of the change in the drug laws. This is the way the law is changing because the 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 change in the pursuit laws, and we have departments now instead of spending their time and energy doing public relations to try to get people to feel safe and and be, uh, you know, cooperative with the police and and help make a safer, more civilized society, they're saying, hey, look, folks, you're kind of on your own. We're not going to be able to do this because of what the legislature did. We're not going to be able to do this because of what the legislature did. And this new rule about pursuits, unless we have this, this, and this, we simply can't pursue someone. And, you know, my visceral gut reaction is like, you know, it's over and above, separate from debating whether that's a smart policy or not, because you're not going to have criminals trying to get away from cops doing 70 miles an hour through a school zone. Okay, great. There's there's your one point, your mm -hmm. valid point. Right. But my visceral response is when you make people not feel safe, bad things come of that. Right. Yeah. No, I agree with that. And I think we are seeing the fallout from that. Um, so, yeah, I have to a caveat here. In, I've said this to you five minutes ago. I haven't been paying as much attention to the news as you do just for my own personal reasons. But when I hear about things like that, like you just shared that, this is the first time I've heard about that this morning, uh, the shooting that happened up in Lakewood. And, you know, my gut reaction is, well, <laughs> what a fucking retard. <laughs> Sorry. But, as far, but, well, the guy turned out to be a felon in possession right. of a gun. And it may be a, may not be quite as bad as it looks as far as like a, a, a vigilante kind of taking things into his own hands. But I just, it's the first I've heard. But and, that is what I, that was one of the first things I thought. In all honesty, my brain went to, okay, here we go, right? Mm -hmm. People are starting to take the take the law into their own hands because they don't feel safe. Because if law enforcement's not going to protect us, if they're stating that they're not, if it's if we're seeing that they're not, because you know fewer and fewer of them are willing to get out and engage. You know, I've talked to law enforcement officers. I've I've talked to a number of my my old friends, um, and some, you know, it's like. So anecdotally, there was a cop that I used to work with down in Anaheim when I was down in Anaheim as a police officer in California. And um, it, we used to joke about the fact that he would back into a parking structure in his district um, and spend his whole night in there writing reports and responding from there to calls. And he got away with it. You, by responding, you mean not responding? Or no, he, responding left, by he left from there to go to call. Oh, we didn't have color. We did. This is dark ages. We didn't have phones in our cars back then. He would respond to there from there to the call and back again, right? So in other words, he did did no did no proactive patrol because he didn't want to get hurt. You know, he didn't want to get he didn't want the liability. He, and we're talking this is a this is the mid eighties, early to mid eighties, right? So, you know, that's just anecdotally. That's just one guy way back then. But now you're starting to see more and more officers who are not willing to go out and put their life or their their career you know, on the line. So when I for, read, you know, for things that, you know, it, it, again, it's risk reward. I mean, every one of the people that I used to work with, I mean, obviously if you got a hot call, you, you're trying to keep, you know, you've got supervisors telling people to stay, you know, in their district <laughs> because we need someone over here to handle mm -hmm. stuff. We, we can't all be rushing to this crime. You know, you, you still have people that are like that, that want to be involved. They want to be, you know, that's what they got. That's what they got into law enforcement for was to to go help people to to be involved in those situations and um 
So now you've got more and more that are not willing to, unless it's happening right in front of them. Or, you know, I was talking about just being out on the freeway and watching, you know, the volume of people who are just willing in the city and on the freeway to just drive, not just five, eight, 10 miles an hour of the speed limit, 15, 17, 20 miles an hour of the speed limit and getting away with it on a regular basis, just because it's like, it's a free for all, you know, as I, you know, it, do state troopers still stop people? Sure they do. But are they going to be as willing, you know, is the risk, the, the whole risk reward idea is, you know, is this the outcome of this going to be, you know, I, I don't know what they're thinking. I'm only supposing, but I'm, I'm telling you, I, I, I'm just that alone, just seeing the trend and, and things that, you know, you and I've talked about where, where crime seems like it's getting worse and worse and worse because people are on, I, my assumption is that people are under the general belief that there's not really going to be any consequences. I can get away with this. Everybody else is, or you look at it and say, well, shit, if they can get away with that, if they can take over a, a whole part of downtown Seattle for, you know, two months or however long, you know, it, it, then if they can do that, why can't I, and why can't I defend my family or why can't I protect my truck in the case of this guy? I'm not saying that's what he was thinking, but you see that kind of attitude starting to become more pervasive. In your professional experience, I mean, you may not have seen that in the past, but to armchair quarterback it, how do you walk that back? Uh, well, I didn't No, He didn't. You once in a while, you'd see that very rarely. Did you see that kind of attitude more often? But you didn't see society kind of no. drifting toward this, no. this uh, entropy. How, how do we get back to, you know what? We're all going to toe the line just a little bit more. We don't need to see 24 seven, uh, social media and and news showing, uh, you know, the decline and fall of the Western civilization. But but if that's if we're seeing more and more crime, uh, and less and less belief in, that there is a rule of law, what do you see as a way to kind of walk that back and get back to a little bit more uh, civilized society? Well, it, it's, uh, we were talking about this earlier too, you know, you, you, the focus right now, uh, is all on the officer on patrol. If we're going to talk about law enforcement in terms of enforcing the laws in this situation, right? So it's all focused on the, the officer out there doing what he or she does, but they're not making the changes. They're not making the laws. They're, they're susceptible to them. Laws are being written because of choices that they're making. But again, given the toolbox that they have or had and that, you know, the, the, the dynamics of what's happening now, they're not the ones who are, you know, can make those decisions, can make the changes, right? It, it goes way above them. I mean, so we walk that back. You have to start looking at administrations and I don't mean just the police department administrations. You have to look at city councils. You have to look at mayors. You have to look at pr prosecutors. You have to look at judges, people who are making these laws. Legislatures. So if we pass yes. a law saying that, um, like I just mentioned, uh, you cannot pursue a criminal except in these extreme circumstances um, because it's too much of a risk to society, you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, <laughs> I... You know, it, again, it, it's you have to take some of those things on the merit of what they are, and you have to give people the ability to make those judgment calls. You know, that's the thing that always frustrated me. I'm going to kind of dance around that <laughs> in a way, that question, because it's not that I don't want to answer it. It's that you can't, you can't, you cannot legislate 100% uh, everything that's going to make everybody happy or be in everybody's best interest. You just can't. You have to leave. I hate to use this word, but you have to leave some gray area where people are able to make the judgment call in the moment. Does that mean that there's human error? Fuck yeah. There's human error in anything we do. Unfortunately, there are higher stakes for law enforcement. So you have to have you know, smaller margin of error, better right, judgment. So exactly. On. And you have to hold them to a higher standard. We were talking about this very thing just a few minutes ago as well and holding law enforcement to a higher standard. And is that fair or is it not fair? But if you're going to put people out there and let them and expect them to make that judgment call and expect them to make the choice in the moment, you have to give them, you have to give them the tools you have. And I don't mean just the physical tools of the job, but you have to give them the tools, you know, emotionally, mentally, um, uh, tactically with the, the training, but, but emotional training, you know, as well as 
just, you know, we put too many people, we're, as far as I'm concerned, our, our, our academies are too short, but the follow-up training really is, is really what is lacking. And that's the thing that I, you know, I've harped on forever. The Tumwater was an example of, um, an agency that, you know, we didn't, we got good training. We had, there was enough money in the city to have good training, but not enough to pay us a salary that Olympia made, right? The larger you get, the harder it is to pay everybody to go out and, you know, get trained. I used this example last time we were talking, but Seattle PD, uh, they, I don't know where they're at now, but they used to go to the range one time and qualify per year. Now they didn't just shoot once a year, but they qualified once a year, you know, shooting at paper targets. And from the best of, to the best of my knowledge, that was, if that was all they got, then that was good enough. They at least qualified, right? They, if, if they got more, well, okay, good. Some of that was on them, you know, and it 100% was on them to go out and make sure they stayed proficient. And yes, and you could very easily say, absolutely, you should do that. But, you know, you work 12 hour shifts and, you know, deal with family and everything else and then try to factor into that having the time to go out and stay proficient when if it's an expect expectation this is an old argument if it's the expectation of the job then why can't they provide the time for us to do that on duty right and so tom water did they bit that bullet and said yeah you're right this is important we want to make sure both we're covering our ass because we know you've gotten the training but we're also looking out for you to make sure. so it happened and we would get trained on duty thurston county sheriff's was another one that i know did i worked with them a lot worked with their training cadre uh, over the years and the point i'm making is that if you're going to invest that kind of energy and time into people and and you know you you we're getting, let me, let me roll way back. So if you're going to have people out there that are making those judgment calls and you're expecting them to, and you should, because that's what you're paying them for, you know, give them the, give them the tools that they need. If you're going to essentially legislate this and say they can, or they can't, you're going to wind up with a bunch of robots who aren't making wise decisions in the moment. Yeah. On the one hand, sure. They're not going to chase somebody. They're not going to pursue somebody. And so that person that gets away may very well go out. I mean, this is the argument for the other side. That person goes out and commits another crime, rapes your daughter, yada, 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 right? I mean... Well, the other part of the argument, though, is that you training the wrong skill set. You are, you're putting too much on cops' shoulders, trying to make them a CPS worker, trying to make them a mental health worker, trying to make them a drug and substance abuse expert, trying to make them a a therapist trying to make them a suicide prevention person trying to make them a uh, a, a skilled uh, soldier a door kicker um animal control officer that's too much on cops no wonder they snap that's too much on cops no wonder they have uh disproportionate high levels of suicide of drug abuse and and, and alcoholism of uh domestic violence and and divorce um, so what we need to do is uh, take a lot of those things off of cop shoulders and just have them be cops. Um, I told you earlier that I, when I hear that argument, I think it's disingenuous. I think it's a crock for let's disband cops and we'll all kind of kumbaya. Mm -hmm. um, it's never been proven anywhere. It's never worked anywhere, no. uh, except for maybe a, a, you know, a small group of people of, of less than 20. Um, but, what do you say? If, if, if you could have all the support in all those different areas and all you had to do was just be a cop, what, what would you be? Would that make you just a, 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 a SWAT officer? Would that make you just a parking cop? What, what would? Well, let me, let me take a little bit different response or, or, or answer to that. I'm going to, I'm going to actually dance around this one too. How many people out there want to do the job of a cop? First of all, a lot fewer now yeah, than did right. two years ago. We had a hard time trying for a while when we were recruiting people to get every agency I knew in this County and every one across this state that I was aware of had a deficit. They well, didn't, they didn't, they had the people. lower physical performance standards. They exactly. had the lower IQ and they had a lower character and credit. All the standards that you judged the right. candidates by have had to be lowered significantly in some of these large departments you're talking about, right. like LA where sure. they had to, cause they couldn't find enough viable candidates. Right. So let me get, get back to my question. Who wants to do the job? And if if you relegate law enforcement to just a small portion of what we're talking about, and we, you know we can define that later, but if you relegate them to just a small portion, who's going to take up the slack? Who else is going to go out and go to those calls? Are you going to get social workers to go into a domestic disturbance? Yes, you know? we should stop spending so much money on paramilitary 
um, uh, Judge Dreads, and we should get mental health workers, and substance abuse that's workers. That's why and we're putting bulletproof workers. vests on firefighters and actually considering arming some of them in some areas, right? Because it's okay to not go in with with the right tools to do the job. I'm playing devil's advocate here for a moment, okay? Because that's what I, you know, that's what you're seeing. On the one hand, you get the people who are the good guys, the nice guys, firefighters. They are the ones who go put the bandages on people and stop the bleeding and save lives and all of that, right? They're getting less, they, they, first of all, the entirety of my career, the entirety of my career, and this is no slam on firefighters, regardless of the fun we like to make of each other. The entirety of my career, they were, they would literally show up within a block, half a block of a situation and say, okay, we're staging. We're waiting for law enforcement to get here. They're not going into that situation. Right. And okay. Maybe the argument is, well, those are the only kind of situations we send law enforcement into, but I can't tell you how many times I had situations that, you know, you have to train for it. You walk into it. If you're, if you're stupid, you walk into it blindly. Right. But you walk into it somewhat blindly thinking, oh, yeah, it's just a paper call. I'm going to take a response. I'm, I'm responding to a, a vehicle prowl that's clear and they have no suspects and, you know, I'm going to get it. And, and you wind up walking into a can of worms. Now you take and you elevate that and you put people's emotions into it. If you're talking about social workers and people who are going to have to go and deal with those situations, you know, if you feel like law enforcement can't handle that type of thing or, or shouldn't handle that type of thing. So what about the argument that in that example of um, medics – from the fire department staging, mm -hmm. you're not being asked to go uh, shock somebody back to life right. because that's not your forte. Precisely. You're being asked to make sure that, that the coast is clear because they have somebody who's unconscious that they're not sure if it's a heart attack or an OD and there's some uh, uh, conflict that happened earlier. You're not sure what the status is. So you're going to go deal with that, put that fire right and let the experts in first aid come or paramedics come right. and do their work. If we take that analogy and say, well, you're also not an expert in schizophrenia. Um, let's have somebody come and handle that. So you don't right. have to be an expert in schizophrenia. You're, you're not an expert in um, another form of you know medical care, but, but overdoses. Um, let, let's have somebody else. So now we start, you're not, you're not an expert in. Um, but can I tell you that each of those two things that you have brought up, the potential for violence is always there. Right. So we don't so, take cops out of the equation. We do the a, a version of staging with those. If you did that in four or five different specialties, we'll call them, would that work? Maybe. It, I mean, it, it might. The, I mean, because the, the thing is, at this point, all of it has been dumped on law enforcement. It's like, well, we don't know what to do with that. The The vast majority of the calls that I handled in the last couple of years of my career, as I've been retired now a little bit, the vast majority of the calls that I handled were dealing with mental health issues in one form or another. I, that, that takes everything from, you know, someone who's drunk on the street yelling and screaming to someone who's, you know, naked running around. That's domestic disturbances that are happening in, you know, a little homeless camp. It's everything from someone's panhandling aggressively to the person's you know, they're talking to themselves or trying to hold their head on because it's floating away. I mean, you name it. So let's let's maybe slay a sacred dragon here or slay a sacred cow. Um, because you were a cop, you had a gun um, and some other tools. Because you were a cop and you had to respond to some of those things, either as the front line, the first line, or the only line in right. some cases, uh, were you more likely to kill those people than if a... Uh, crisis intervention mental health professional came and showed up? No, of course not. That's the argument, is that uh, you shouldn't be handling those because uh, you're armed and equipped and trained killer, and uh, we need somebody who's got a little bit more soft people skills. Right. That's that's your argument. Uh, that, well, not, not yours, I know. I'm saying that that's the argument that they want to pose. No. To me, that's a ridiculous notion. How come? because we're human beings. Cops are not just trained killers. In fact, for the most part, uh, the sad truth of the matter is, and, and I, I'll take some heat from law enforcement for this, most of the cops that I work, I was a firearms instructor, brother, for years. There were very, very good shots in our department, if you will, 
you know, I had no doubt in a firefight they could handle themselves. And I had people that struggled from the time they got hired until the time I left or the time they retired to even hit, well, hit to a barn. Even, yeah, to even qualify, <laughs> right? So you have that you have the broad spectrum and you have everything from the apathetic attitude toward training, you know, in firearms, oh here we go again, to the one who's out there and they really they like shooting. Okay. You know, they're all humans. They all have different skill sets. That person who wasn't, that I'm thinking of, that necessarily wasn't the best shot, that person was amazing at dealing with folks who had mental health. He well, just if you had have that much gap, of a you know, spec- He was yeah. like a mental health whisperer, right? So- <laughs> Absolutely. And it's true. I, it's one of my biggest pet peeves about the whole defund the cop argument is um, I used to do that all the time. Be the guy that showed up in a bad situation. Um a lot of times before cops got there, not because, because I wasn't the guy that had the power to involuntarily commit people, but I would get called to a homeless person uh, who's either strung out or mentally or, or both. And if it wasn't a bad enough thing to merit cops screening it, and it maybe we weren't sure if it was a bad enough thing to merit involuntarily detaining somebody, I'd be the first line of defense. And, um, you know, just like you said about handling a firearm, some cops were better than others. Some folks who, who who did show up to help out had incredible skills. You know, they had incredible experience and they had incredible skills. They may not have certain letters after their name. They may not have certain uh, training. But if they're, just like you said, if they're going to those types of calls all the time, right. you can bet that they don't just bring a hammer and everything looks like a nail. They bring a toolbox and they find out whether they can, you know, relate to somebody and uh, connect with them, de-escalate them. All the things that um, it seems like every college kid in the country right now w- with with one class of Psych 101 under their belt uh, assumes that every cop is is the punisher and, and is just, you know, coming in guns a-blazing. And, thanks and it's, to, just thanks wasn't, to television and the media. Well, I think to some degree, part, because yeah. it's not it's not based in reality, and it's really not that hard to dispel. Most communities have at least one department where you can get your background checked and go for a ride along. It's been you know hiccuped because of coronavirus and lockdown mm-hmm. and such, right. but you can actually go ride with a cop, see what their life is really like, see the kind of bullshit that they're put or through. Or go through a Citizens Academy that's several oh, weeks or you get a couple to do it, of months yeah, long. Six, eight and, weeks. Yeah, right. And... and and it, it's not just looking at the cool toys and gizmos and or what what the back end of the jail looks like. It's actually seeing that, oh, you know what? I couldn't have handled myself in that situation. Right. I couldn't have kept my cool. So, if somebody was that way to me, that disrespectful, how did you not cry or fight or shoot? Right. So when I first retired, I opened a firearms training business. And my partner and I, we bought this badass state-of-the-art video trainer. And the idea was to be able to take people into all kinds, you know, take all people from all walks of life, people who had experience and not experience, you know, no experience, who were afraid of handguns for that matter, and give them an opportunity to learn in a safe environment. We didn't have to go to a shooting range. You didn't have to buy ammunition. So here we've got this 15 by 12 screen that we can set up pretty much anywhere. We use real Glocks that had no live guts in them. They basically were stripped down of, of, uh, of the firing mechanism. A laser was put in with a, a recoil system, and so you'd fire a laser, and the gun, the gun actually recoiled in your hand. Very realistic is mm-hmm. my point, right? Um, so using that, uh, most of the people that came through that, and the, everything from the basic class that we had through the advanced classes that we were training, we'd put them into these situations where they had to um, shoot, no shoot, make decisions. And I, you know, to a person coming out the other end of those, they were always going, wow, that was insane. God, my heart rate is, you know, through the roof and um, I'm breathing heavy and, you know, and you can go through and tell them all the things that are, are is happening to them physiologically and then train them on how to back that down. My point, though, is exactly what you're saying. You know, whether you're going through a Citizens Academy or you're going through a scenario that's putting you into real life it, and, you know, your brain doesn't differentiate. That's the interesting thing. That's why porno works. People look at porn because it your brain doesn't know that you're not looking at a real sex act. Cog- cognitively, yes, but but, you know, in the deep you know, deep part of our, part of our brain, the amygdala, you do, you can't, and that's not the part that recognizes whether it's pornography or not, but that's the point in the deep, you know, uh, reptilian parts of our brain, we think we're there. That's why when you're in those 
training scenarios like we used to have your your heart rate's elevated your breathing's you know more rapid all of that happens your you know the adrenaline dump everything because your brain can't differentiate and so putting people into those situations uh, very often makes them real average people who've never done it realize oh shit there's a lot more to this than i thought there was you know that's the one thing i did like about law enforcement over the course of your career, over the entirety, not only do you have, op- I had opportunity to do a very, you know, vast spectrum of, I was a dare officer and I was a, sw- a SWAT cop and I worked undercover narcotics for a while. I got to do all of those different things as well as being a police officer and a training officer and, you know, and, uh, and teaching people how to respond to active shooter and, and got deep into each one of those things when I did it. But I wasn't, I, I may have specialized in that moment, but I, I was, a, you know, cops are generalists. You have to be able to go back out ultimately. You know, they say that the Marine, first and foremost, is a rifleman. Well, it's the kind of, it's, you know, I don't like that analogy for law enforcement, but first and foremost, you are a street cop and, you know, that's what you do. You can specialize in all these things, but at the end of the day, if we need you out there to go deal with whatever, you're going to come out, you're going to leave your desk and you're going to go out and back the guys on the street up because that's what you do, right? And you are a generalist and that makes you more well-rounded and more able to handle different situations as they come up. So, sorry. If that that's what a... you, if that, if that's your your take on law enforcement, and it's going to make um, less. That that's that's directly opposed to the argument that says we need cops to not handle so m- such a broad spectrum of problems because they they keep killing too many people, or we keep having too many um, uh, unfair policing against minorities, or. They're uh, wearing their duty belt twenty four seven. I don't know. I don't agree with some of these arguments, so I'm I'm trying to pull. But that's a, those are the two big ones, right? Is that we have unequal policing among different groups. Usually, the argument is against people of color. Um, there's also uh, you know allegations of of uneven policing against LGBTQ community. I don't know any cases myself of where you know, transgender or pride parades or, you know, gay parts of town or communities are being in any way uh, targeted targeted or, I mean, or Stonewall, ignored, you know, ignored, 50 yeah. years ago. But, um, but right. So uh, sometimes a lot of that, you know, we just sort of start throwing more stuff on the fire, hoping that something will stick and it'll start to, to, to explode. I, I am almost of the opinion now looking at the arguments, anti-cop, anti-cop, anti-cop is that there is this faction of you can't tell me what to do mm, right i mean which there's always been elements of that whether it's a, well, a wild redneck or whether it's a hardened uh dude on the street in the inner city but small sure and and, and if that's, and that's growing what I was talking about that become even so, something as, as small as as just speeding right you know you were talking about death by paper cuts or the, the whole idea of the broken windows and the, you know, and the... Uh, Incremental, you know. slow yeah. slow drift. Exactly, right? So if if that's something that I'm seeing, because I'm trained to pay attention to that stuff, I, as a poli- I'm, granted, I haven't done it for a little while, but that's what we did, you know, you can gauge someone's speed just by how fast they're... So what so, kind of conclusion are you drawing if you see that trend uh, upticking? Well, my conclusion is if you're seeing it there, where else is it happening? You know, it's like anything. There's always the tip of the iceberg. What's going on below that? But are I'm you a- saying that because you're seeing little bits of something as as benign, as yes. creep in people's top speed, is it because they're not getting as much on the street enforcement to knock their travel speed back no, down? getting back to what you just or said. Or is it because they're just getting a little bit more giving the man the middle finger? Right. I think it's a little of both, but probably more what you just, you know, what you just said. Did we have road rage when you started your cop career? Had you ever heard of that? Or was it the, something the, that came on in the middle the, of your career? The term came on within my career. I can't tell you. I, probably towards the early part of my career and all. Well, so my career br- bridged between 1983. Yeah. I became a reserve cop clear back then. All the way through 2015. So, so some people kind of make this case that there was some fundamental shift that uh, that you would never see people want to murder someone over. Right, and, uh, and that's true. Yes. Looking at them askance in traffic or, or or riding their bumper. Right, and then all of a sudden, yes, and you know, I mean, a lot of I, I've even said it myself: the too many rats in the cage or an analogy. Right, when I first got into law enforcement. Uh, we didn't see road rage wasn't a thing. There wasn't a term for it. You might have 
you know, maybe inadvertently said I was raging or whatever, but it wasn't, you know, and then yes, all, all of a sudden it became a thing. Road rage was a thing. And so now you're seeing, or you were starting to see more and more and it became, it became a daily thing. We would hear it, you know, dispatched to other, whether it's us or other agencies, you know, you're hearing the dispatch calls for road rage. And sometimes with social behaviors like that, there's sort of two, two lines of thinking on it. One is, oh, this guy was susceptible to the same pressures and influences in society uh, that this guy was, and these guys both went off and shot somebody or attacked somebody. So it's because they're in the same pressure cooker that you had the same type of outcome. The other sort of theory is that this guy went off inside of, he was in a pressure cooker within the same influences and he went off. The fact that he went off and made the news and so on, just somehow in, in the, the global scheme of things, the fact that somebody can go off in traffic and try to hurt somebody, never even conceivable in our group consciousness or in our awareness is now conceivable. It's sort of like the, the Roger Bannister and the, uh, what is it? The six minute mile? I forget which one mm-hmm. it is, but that was inconceivable right. to break. The four minute as mile. As soon as he broke it, all of a sudden, um, yeah. yeah, I guess six minutes isn't that fast. Well, it's good, but it's not fast, not world class. It was right. it was inconceivable for decade after decade. As soon as he broke it, within weeks, boom, 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 boom. Other guys did exactly. Is it because of some change in physics in 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 the wind around the globe? No, it's because of something in the psyche of those right. people. Exactly. And, I'm I'm not harping on on the whole road rage things to get off on a tangent. My point is that um, something has has uh, something's in the water as far as right. not being afraid of consequences to inhibit our behavior. It, it used to be. I mean, we had a case uh, here in the Pacific Northwest. I think it's been about three years now, where a and I believe it's an, an emergency room surgeon. From JBLM, the, the the military base, just south of Seattle, uh, uh, pulled a guy out of his car, an o- older guy, you know, maybe twenty years his senior, and and beat the hell out of him. And you 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 know, I mean, walk that back from from a guy with a career in the military to a guy who's a physician um, to a guy who's twenty years younger. Usually, th- th- those three things, one of those three things might stop somebody from getting into a bar fight or something. All three of those three things ab- about the situation were present, and still the guy went, you know, who knows what was going on in his life, but my point, it, it seems like the, 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 the whole crux why I wanted to talk to you about this is it seems like the fear of consequences or the rule of law seems to not be doing its job like it used to, which is an interesting point that gets debated that whether it used to or not in the first place. The good old boy traditionalists say, you know what? We need a good swift kick in the ass. You need to get paddled in school. And and then Mm -hmm. the other side of the the political equation says, oh gosh, you know, if you paddle somebody in school, you're traumatizing, abusing, and so on. Move that forward to societies where, you know, they have dire consequences, stoning, cutting hands off, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, caning. Well, some of those places have pretty low Mm. uh, crime rates. We're never going to get there, nor should we necessarily for corporal punishment, but we seem to have a populace that either um, is intolerant of imposing consequences on criminal behavior um, or doesn't fear the consequences of criminal behavior anymore or both both yeah i would say it's probably both if you're a cop out on the street you know five years ago did you what was the average person say you ran into 10 uh uh, people you arrested in a in a week i don't know if you arrested that many a week or not or in in a day but 10 arrestees how many people were afraid of the consequences i would say of the people that we arrested because you got to remember we're, we're only catching a, a percentage of the people that we arrested, probably not many. They're familiar with the justice system for the most part. The caveat to that would be people who are getting arrested. Your average person who becomes a criminal, quote unquote, because they get popped for DUI. That's the one place where most of the time an average person who's not really a criminal mind or doesn't have that kind of a propensity is 
really coming into contact with law enforcement in a very, very negative way with very, very extreme or, you know, reasonable, but extreme consequences. Right. So, but getting back to your original question. So most of the people that we were arresting by and large, and this is a generalization, they're criminal. The so, criminal mind they, they are they've had a propensity for it this right. is not their first rodeo we're not arresting him for the first time and that's the point they're obviously not, they're not they terrified their no. name's going to be all over the newspaper no and and, right. and their their status you in know, the community you're, you're, is going to get eroded white collar criminal your your uh your uh politician caught in some sort of a you know criminal act of some sort uh, a business owner owner who's embezzling something again that's white collar yeah those people might be Afraid of consequences. Yeah, but so it's interesting to me that you bring up DWI or DUI now because I don't want to minimize its danger and impacts to victims and so on. But it is a in the scheme of felonies and so on or violent crime. It's it's not that mm-hmm. it, it can be in vehicular right. homicide and so right. on. But but it is a an offense that has some pretty extreme mandatory consequences, right? right? There's not a whole lot of room for, uh, you know, there's deferred prosecution and so on, but there's also you lose your license for, for a whole year, and, and it depends on what state you're in and so on, and, and you have this many thousand dollars in fine, and you have a minimum term of jail, this many term, this, uh, it's just, it's mandatory. Mm-hmm. It's interesting to me that in the realm of screaming voices for sentence reform, for reducing consequences, um, the one thing that you just sort of pulled out of your back pocket as an example was the one charge that because of a huge citizen campaign in the 80s of Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, the mm-hmm. consequences for DUI went through the roof. Right. Right. I mean, there were habitual offenders who, you know, had 16 uh, and now there are even habitual offender laws about uh, DUI cause and effect. I mean, do you, do you think that the the effect of putting such dire consequences on that charge is what leads to what you said when people get popped for that who are not hard, you know, career criminals, but they're, you know, oh my God, this is this is so terrifying because the consequences are so dire. It's mm-hmm. not being out of compliance for my emission system. Right. So yeah, I mean. I Are have, you then making the case for dire consequences lead to change in behavior? And uh, you know that's a unique that's a unique situation, and I, I think that argument falls down too to a degree. But again, you're talking about the difference between the general populace and seasoned or veteran criminals. So, right? does anything make your frequent flyers fear? You, I mean, fear being arrested, fear being put back into the system again. I mean, most of them don't want to go to jail. Sure. Right. That's why you have people run from law enforcement. That's why you have people committing crimes at night. That's but they I mean. also don't want, I'm going to say a double negative. They also don't want to avoid jail enough to, to not commit a crime. Uh, and well, okay. So let's, so the, the whole idea of risk reward again, right? The vast, yeah, not all of them. But the vast majority of the people that I probably dealt with and arrested on a regular basis were involved in criminal activity because they were uh, chemical addicted in some form, be it, you know, in the early part of my career, cocaine, the middle part of my career, meth, and then heroin. They're criminally, I mean, they are, they are addicted chemically to something. And that's what's, that is what is the driver behind them, the, the, the dopamine rush that they have to get because they can't get it naturally anymore because they're dopamine receptors are fucked up and so they're willing to do that so that's you know the direct answer is yeah they're not afraid of the consequences not really because even if they are they don't want to get caught but the reality is the reason they don't want to get caught isn't because the system is so hard it's not because you know i mean they get a place to sleep they get food they get you know a shower but they don't get they don't get drug of choice right and that's the point that's what they're afraid of not getting the drug of choice and so you know that that's a that's one of those arguments that you can go round and round on forever because okay you do you know what do you come down harder on drugs well we've we've already seen the war on drug drugs doesn't work right 
But, but, don't you just but, need to come down you, harder? But don't you, the way you did? But do, but do you throw the you know the baby out with the bathwater and say, okay, we're going to legalize everything? We might as well just make heroin legal too, because you know, I mean, that's what we're it seeing. Worked right? in Portugal is the is yeah, the, the yeah, genius yeah, solution yeah, exactly. And Portugal's not the society like America, and it doesn't have the same demographic, and you know, you, it's not even apples and oranges, so it doesn't work. But but you know, yeah, it, that's a good question. It's been an argument that's been. So if you have uh, frequent flyers that are, um, that, that you know, criminals, they do criminal behavior so they can get their drug of choice, um, that's an alibi, that's a medical disability, and on and on and on. Uh, we should excuse it. We should not have you involved. We should have a substance abuse counselor come and, and give them a cleaner drug that's not going to overdose and kill them or cleaner needles that's not going to give them hepatitis or, or HIV or so on. Um, what's your explanation for the dude who could steal something from a store or from somebody's backyard, um, which they do all the time, right? We have, we have an entire underground bike trade in our, in our community. We have an entire, um, you said it, catalytic uh, converter, right? Catalytic converters is, is the big thing right now, but we also have criminals, this, this to me is one of the most interesting uh, that I'd, I'd love to dissect. Criminals who will do stuff that is five, uh, I'm just going to, three times harder than it would be to earn the same amount of money by opening up with their own little coffee stand. And what I mean by that is, wow, that dude did that much work to strip wires how long did it take him? What tools did he need? And what bullshit did he have to go through to get that copper and then go sell it? And that's the money he got out of it versus if he would have gone and done, you know, any one of, you know, just as difficult jobs for a day or for the same number of hours would have made more money and wouldn't have gotten put in jail. But there's something about giving the man the middle finger, Something about antisocial behavior that says you can't tell me what to do. I'm not going to succumb to the system and follow the rules. I get an extra little secondary reward of some kind in my brain or in my right. you know you know neurological squirt system from from saying you know f you right. And you just said it. Okay, let's. How, how do you how do you legislate or punish against that? You can't. And let me back up for just a second, Larry. Let me let me, let me uh, add to what you were just saying. That there's there's way more truth than our society wants to realize in what you just said. It's that little squirt of dopamine, right? I don't want to do a boring job. You don't want to do a boring job, or you would have chosen something different. Now, everybody's definition of boring is different, right? It's all it 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 is uh, different strokes, different folks, right? So, but if if given the opportunity, the kind of people who are oftentimes committing those kinds of crimes. There's a reason that this is kind of an interesting thing and it's, it's funny, but there's some truth in it. There's a reason that there are, there are some psychologists or some people in the, you know, in the, in the psychological field that basically say that law enforcement officers and criminals aren't that, that different. And there's truth in that because what motivates them, what drives them, if you look at different, you know, if you look at some of the studies that have been done on that, um, again, at looking at the fear you know, factor the the risk reward. What drives them is is actually that pleasure seeking, that dopamine hit. Right? We don't think about it that way necessarily, but that's what drives different people into different types of careers. Whether you're going to get it here doing one thing or over here doing something different, right? That's what has driven you for the most part, unless unless that's not a part of your DNA. Right. So if you're not, if you are not as motivated by those types of things, if you actually aren't that pleasure seeking or you're not as high in risk, risk averse, risk, right. If, yeah, thank you. If you're risk averse, then you're probably not going to do those kinds of things. But people who do, who are involved in criminal behavior, they don't want a job a lot of times doing is generalization, but they don't want a job starting a coffee shop. They may not have had the benefit of the education to be able to do that, but there are a lot of high level criminals out there doing, you know, really heinous things. Um, right now with regard to fraud, fraud's off the freaking hook. 
Well, I mean, and, it, and that's what I'm dealing with now in my job. I'm working as a fraud investigator and it's off the hook. So, but the point is, again, could, could they take that know-how and could they do the same type of job working as an IT specialist at some place? And yeah, they don't want to in part because that's not what motivates them. It's not what trips their trigger. They would rather, again, I'm generalizing, but the, you know, they would rather go out and, and commit that kind of a, uh, those types of crimes because, well, for one thing, they can, the, the payoff is pretty good if they are successful, right? Secondarily, they don't have to jump through all the societal hoops to get there. So yeah, in part, you know, giving the finger to the man, I'm going to do this on my own. I don't need that. I'm smart enough to do this without having to go through, you know. All kinds of self-esteem rewards, right, self-actualization. Right, right. So, you know, I mean, it's a it's a whole lot more complex than just being able to legislate something away, right? As far as, you know, getting back to your <laughs> earlier question. Well, to me, it, it, it's it's a really tough situation because uh, you some folks don't want to admit that, that they're just, you know, and and historically we'll, we'll call them antisocial behaviors, yeah, antisocial well, and those- personalities. There's divinations beyond that. But to me, um, people who have uh, that carrot juice look in their eye, who are sure that everybody can be reached, everybody can be fixed, everybody can be loved enough out of their addiction, out of their criminal behavior, out of their antisocial personality, don't seem to acknowledge or have a clue that you're not going to... Um, Get, well, you're not going to be more powerful than that drug is in somebody's brain. Right. But to, to me, the, those are the same people who are trying to demasculinize America. Right. If you take and you take all the testo- testosterone out there and you, you know, you, you subdue it, you take all the, you, you, you literally take all the type A people, you know, if you want to use that old term and, you know, you, you subdue them. Well, then, you know, you don't have the problem anymore because you don't have a bunch of people out there who are that kind of personality who are, right? So So should we make them all just cops? (laughs) (laughs) No. Uh, What do you do with them? I mean, those people hopefully go to jail if they're being really bad and they go to jail for a really long time. Right. And I've heard criminals say with age... You know, not necessarily comes wisdom, but something just happened. Yeah, of course. And maybe it's when their tea goes down. It could but be. something happens somewhere, you know, a little bit later where they're just not in that, um, you know, the phases of a man's life, if you want to use your man ana- or, you know, masculine well, analogy. I mean, because the vast majority of criminals in jail are male, male right. right? So, so and if they're not are, in that phase. There are those that their argument is it's all about mass, it's all about test- testosterone and masculinity. That's the real problem. If we would just, you know, deal with that, we wouldn't. You know, I'm generalizing and I'm oversimplifying, but that's what I keep hearing. If if we are to stick with the death by a thousand paper cuts comment that we are inching our way away from the rule of law, away from civilized society, toward more people doing whatever the hell they want, which you know, that's the definition of freedom, as long as you don't hurt other people. But that's not that one little disclaimer is the part that's not being honored. We got a lot of people that are hurting other people, and you say that you've seen it in you know subtle things, just like people not really being worried about following the speeding li- speed limit anymore. And I say, well, geez, these statistics all over these uh, major metro areas are are off the hook, and cops. Not only are you having a tough time finding cops, but you have cops. You know, Seattle's PD is now at their lowest per capita or either gross total since it was in the in the mid '80s, apparently. Where do we go from here? I mean, do you think we're headed toward more vigilantism and the cops well, just saying, sorry, we can't uh, handle anything other than priority calls right now? Portland's riot team endured a year of utter bullshit, of mm-hmm. having urine and feces thrown on them, of Molotov cocktails thrown on them, and a guy got uh, uh, prosecuted, a, a police officer, for pushing a girl with his baton, not whacking her, pushing her. He got, last week, got... Um, Indicted. And this is all over the news. He got indicted, going to be charged by their genius uh, prosecutor, Mike Schmidt. And he is the reason why the entire 50-person brigade of their riot team resigned and said, this is this is insane. You won't prosecute 91.8% of the arrests that we make at these riots, right. but you'll arrest one guy for something that wasn't even egregious that was just in the course of, of doing business. And... My response to to seeing that is, 
wow, that's awful, and it's a it's a canary in a coal mine. But also the backstory to that is that the cops that now have to pick up the slack for that, their their districts, their duties, policing Portland, mm-hmm. go to append status, which means they'll only respond to you know life and limb is being taken right now. Sure. Otherwise, we have to be on call or responding to these to these other you know big civil right. unrest situations. So that now is bleeding out into the suburbs. It's bleeding out into you know bike theft is something that doesn't even you know appear on somebody's radar as a right. cop because they're now in sort of a a constant uh, fight or flight state. They're they're in a constant red alert. Right. Mm-hmm. What quality of policing does that create? You just said it. Everything that you just said, it doesn't. The, you, you have no quality policing. There's no option, right? I mean, and, uh, you know, the on the one side of that argument, you could say, well, that's exactly what you, yeah, you got what you asked for. You want defunding the police. You want, great, here you go. Now you deal with the consequences, well, Mr. Legislature, we ma- Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. we make that same argument for um, people growing up in poverty, people growing up in inner cities, people pe- put humans in a box in this set of circumstances and it's predictable. So, hey, we got to fix these problems. I totally agree with that. But for some reason, put cops in this predicament and you're going to have this outcome for some reason. Fuck them. They, they, you know, if they can't be superhuman, then fuck them. All cops are bastards. You know, right, it, right. it's it's such an interesting hypocrisy to <laughs> say, you know, let's look at human beings in any other situation and say, you know, 99 out of 100 human beings, if given this set of circumstances, will respond this way or 87 out of 100. Who cares? Whatever the number is, if you can ha- sort of predict behavior based upon circumstances and do interventions to help improve outcomes. But then you look at this one tiny little niche called cops And instead of giving that same sort of uh, just scientific approach, Mm -hmm. some people might call it grace or cutting people a break. I just say, give it a scientific approach. Look at it as a a, a social scientist. And, but instead, you know, fuck them if they can't be superhuman, fuck them if they cannot be, uh, disband them, um, humiliate them for not being perfect. And that doesn't mean you should be able to shoot somebody mistakenly and not seek con- or, right. or, or right. wrongfully, I should not. say, and not, not face right. consequences. It doesn't mean you should be able to do what happened to George Floyd. It means that we need to look at how we handle cops the same way and, and solve problems the same way that, that we advocate for trying to solve problems elsewhere. Agreed. Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's interesting because as you're talking about all of that, and as we've been talking this whole morning, um, my, my mind keeps reflecting back on, you know, we have such extremes right now. It's, it's, uh, it's beyond ridiculous. Anybody who is rational and reasonable looks at the world that we have, looks at America, at least right now in America. And we've got these ridiculous extremes and you go from literally everything. If you want to take that example, you just used and if you if you wanted to put the cops in uh, not necessarily a bad light, but just say okay, it would be understandable behavior if they said "fuck you," we're taking our toys and going home. Not not right, not reasonable, but understandable, right? And there's they, been little evidence of like right. blew up blue flu and right. So I mean, again, like I said, I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying I'm just saying you could very easily you, know, you see that, and there has been evidence of it. You've got that extreme, and then you've got the other extreme. Well, let's just take you know all of their power and all of their authority away from them, and we'll only let them do these certain things, or we'll just get rid of the police altogether. You've got these ridiculous extremes, and I would say the vast majority of middle America is probably going, "What the fuck." Why don't we find something in between that's reasonable? But the only people that are really screaming are the people that are screaming the loudest and getting the most attention and that the media is focusing on, whether right or left, it's the extremes. And, you know, we're, we, meanwhile, the rest of us are falling in that gap. The rest of us are becoming victims. <clears throat> the rest of us are having our catalytic converter stolen and nothing's being done about it. You know, all of these things are, are, are occurring It and, like you said, so much of it, I believe, is happening because we've had this vacuum of being in COVID, right? We've all been locked indoors. And so the only, you know, we're not really even seeing realistically what's happening on a day-to-day basis. We're not venturing out. Now we're starting to venture out. You've got, you know, all these different things that have gone on throughout that. The frustration level, you know, for many, many people is through the roof. You've got, I mean, it's, it's, it literally, it's a powder keg waiting to blow. 
And yet we just keep throwing fuel on the fire. We just keep adding fucking gasoline to an already burning fire. And, you know, rather than, you know, at some point, reasonable minds need to start saying, uh-uh. And unfortunately, I think what's going to wind up, my personal opinion is what's going to wind up happening is that pendulum's going to have to swing far enough to one side. And there are going to have to be enough of these people that do become vigilantes and commit these, you know, and do things that really, for all intents and purposes, are probably just this sh- this side of not already crossing the line into into criminal behavior, right? You're going to have to see more of those kind of things before people start waking up and going, oh, wait a minute, how the, how the hell do we deal with this? Because we can't turn our own army on it, not legally, not according to the Constitution. Of course, there are those who want to deal, just do away with the whole Constitution because it doesn't, you know, one of the most brilliant you know, documents that's ever been written and amended to over the years, you know, ever. And but well, let's just do away with it because it's it's archaic and it's you know it's antiquated and it doesn't have, it, it doesn't really apply to today. So what do we wind up with? We wind up with anarchy. That's what the anarchists want. We wind up with total anarchy, and then what? Survival of the fittest, Lord of the Flies on fucking steroids. Then what? I mean, does it have to get to that before people quit being idiots? The the libertarians who want small to the little government anarchists who want messy little no government right republicans who want small government uh, democrats who want bigger government socialists who want all government um you know there, there's all kinds of people pitching sure you know listen to my theory or or are people pitching you know hey this is what's being done to you watch out you know you're right. being sold exactly. a, a bill of goods and and we're not going over Niagara Falls in a a wooden raft. We're headed toward Niagara Falls in a boat, an unsinkable Livingston fiberglass boat with a powerful motor that we've simply chosen not to start up and say, you know, fuck this, I'm I'm going the other direction. Right now, we're just sort of drifting. Right. Um, whether we choose to start that motor up. Whether we choose to take the chances and say, "Hey, this is a a, a Livingston boat that cannot be, you know, an unsinkable," um, you cut them in half, they they're not supposed to sink. You cut them into sections of eight, they probably eventually you can sink them, right? My my analogy is strained, but I think you get the point. Yeah, that, exactly. Um, I, it's it's it'll be interesting to me to see if um, if there's a like you said a middle ground that 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 appears. If coming out of hibernation, if hope for a better tomorrow and, and you know, uh, impending doom with global pandemic, if that sort of depressurization of the pressure cooker helps get us to that middle ground that you're talking about, or if the pendulum truly does have to, do we need to finally get to where you're having 50 people shot in Chicago in one day instead of just 45? Or does that pandemic need to spread to 50 cities before we finally say enough is enough? you know, bring on total government? Or do we move in the direction that we have in so many other areas of our lives and say, uh, you know, personal accountability is not the answer. Self-discipline is not the answer. Uh, uh, Spiritual walk is not the answer. Parenting isn't the answer. Technology is the answer. And, And a lot of people are really starting to criticize 21st century Americans as technology solves everything. And I've already seen videos of stuff that was like a joke when I was a kid watching cartoons of a robot that goes around parks at night. You know, it replaces a cop. You, you can't knock it over. It's got 360 cameras. It can, it can, you know, if it's not a criminal, you can touch a button like an ATM and find out, you know, where you you are if you're lost. If uh, you're there's an emergency, it's got a button to, you know, so... Uh, somehow it may be that we look to technology uh, to fix everything for us the way we have in lots of other realms. But I'll be uh, I'll be talking to you more about yeah. how things evolve or devolve. Yeah. Thanks for listening to the David Ross Show. As always, if you like the show, we'd appreciate you share it, like it, subscribe to get alerts when new episodes come out. Or if you're listening on a platform that has premium content and you want to support the show, we'd appreciate that too. Until next time, take care. Take care.